you so much, uh, Pastor Anthony and Snow. It is such a privilege and an honor to uh, share the word with you this morning. I bring you warm greetings from my own network of household of faith and sons. Some of them are present here this morning and I appreciate your support. Also from my spiritual father, Hara Stradom, and also from the ABC Ministries, Presbytery uh, across South Africa. I want to thank also all of you who are representatives from the different networks, both East and West, who have joined us this morning with their households at this, this meeting. You know, it speaks such a lot when the body of Christ gathers in such a manner. The word that I have to bring this morning is not an easy word. But the Lord has confirmed this word this morning again as Marcel was reading the scriptures and making the de declarations. And as I was waiting on the Lord, He showed me a scale. And what I want to present to you this morning is the scale of God that comes to measure the kingdom. Daniel 5 verse 27 says, you have been weighed in the balances and you have been found wanting. This is a very hard word because when this took place, King Nebuchadnezzar was having a big party. He was having a celebration. And as part of that celebration, he brought out the things that were used in the temple and they desecrated it because it was never intended for that use. And I want to say to you this morning that you are a vessel in the temple of the Lord. The question is, are you a holy vessel or are you a holy or are you a holy vessel that is being desecrated by the king why am i speaking about the king there's a lot of leaders this morning in this house and this word on this platform today we speak to leaders what are you doing with the vessels that God has placed in your household. Do they love you or do they fear you? Do they love you more than what they love the Lord Jesus? Have you taken your sons and have you made them slaves? I want you to know this morning that each one of us this morning is being placed upon the scale of the kingdom of God. He weighs your thoughts, he weighs your actions, and he will hold you accountable for that, just like he did to Belsasar. Balthasar was the son of Nebuchadnezzar and an emperor over the Babylon Empire from about 553 before Christ. He did what pleased himself. He commanded everything that was around him. He had tremendous power and authority and influence across the world. But spiritually, when he was placed on that scale, he weighed nothing. He dishonored God. He never learned from his father's mistakes of pride and how he desecrated the vessels of God 
with his wives and with his concubines. But God placed him on this scale of justice and he found him wanting. Now the question is, what about you and me? What would the Lord be saying to you and me this morning? I want us to take a look this morning and there's only one scale that we can use as we are being weighed. You know, there's a, a saying in the apostolic circles where they say, don't count us, weigh us. So we speak when we say weigh us, we don't speak about like I am bodily weight. They speak about the spiritual weight that you carry of the substance of the word that is on the inside of you. So if I come to you this morning and I say to you, you are being weighed, what is the substance of the word of God on the inside of you? Um, put up that scale for me, please, uh, Pastor Rio. You'll see there's a scale. There's a scale. Now the word tikal is a Hebrew word. It means you've been weighed in the balances and you have been found wanting. But I want you to look at the scale. There's two things that has been placed on that scale. The one is religion and the other one is relationship. What is the weight that is on your scale? Do you live from religion or do you live from relationship? Come on. Religion says I live my life according to a set of rules. Uh, a set that says do's and don'ts. Relationship says I live my life from that place of intimacy with the Lord Jesus. He rules my heart. I live a life where my only passion and my only desire is to please Him. If I ask you this morning, is your life pleasing to Jesus? What would you say to me? You see, the only measurement that we have is Jesus himself yes. as the pattern son. Yes, so pastors, as I said to you, I'm speaking to leaders this morning. Why do you measure yourself against other leaders? That's idolatry. Why do you measure the effectiveness and the size of your congregation against another congregation. Why do you measure your church building against another church building? Why do you measure the type of car that you drive against another pastor's or leader's car? Why do you measure your crocodile leather shoes against my flip-flops? That's pride. Are you guys kidding me this morning? Is your heart truly turned to Jesus? I cannot repeat this enough, pastors, leaders, it's not your church, it's his church, it's not your sons, it is his sons. How do you treat 
his sons. Do you make them your personal slaves? Or do you honor them? Do you as the leader serve them? Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. How did the apostles respond? Lord, we are unworthy. Allow us to wash your feet. But what did Jesus say? Jesus said, I've washed your feet and that is enough. You don't have to have your whole body washed. Feet is symbolic of your walk. Pastors, leaders, are you washing the feet of your sons? How do you walk? I'm not asking you what you are preaching from your pulpit. I'm not asking you what you are telling your sons, what they must do and what they should do and how they should live. I'm asking, do you demonstrate that walk? Come on, guys. If you expect your sons to serve in the house, you need to be out front there, right? In the lead. You should do the lead one serving. You know, we've got this culture that has come through the church where pastors and leaders are placed on a pedestal. If there's some places where I go, they'll whisk me away and put me there in a little corner. I'm not referring to the pastor's lounge here, Anthony, don't worry. And then they put bodyguards at the door. So nobody else in that whole congregation is allowed to engage the leaders that are gathering there. That's a sin. Because you have just placed yourself above the Lord Jesus Christ. Because what did he say? He said, come to me, all of you who are heavenly laden, and I will give you peace. So what we are saying, we are make the grace that God has deposited on the inside of us and on others that He places around of us. We make it inaccessible for those who are in need because we want to be in our little holy huddle and elevate ourselves above the rest of the body of Christ. That's a sin. Are you offended yet? Are you offended? I'm so glad to hear that. So, let us then look at some of the aspects in which we need to measure ourselves where we use Jesus as our pattern son, our measurement, our scale on how do we measure up. The first question that I need to ask you is, are you thirsty? Now, why am I saying this? Because Jesus was thirsty. John 19 verse 28 says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, what did he say? I thirst. Jesus was thirsty while he was hanging on that cross. If we go to another scripture in Psalms 69 verse 21 to 22, it says, They also gave me gal for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Let their table become a snare before them, and their well-being a trap. What caused Jesus to be thirsty? If you are a medical person, you will know. If you lose a lot of blood, one of the first signs that you will experience is you become very thirsty because you are losing the liquids in your body. This thirst that Jesus pronounced 
was a symbol of the sacrifice that he was making. So when I ask you this morning, are you thirsty? I'm asking you, is there any evidence of the sacrifice of laying down your life, being crucified in your life on the cross? Are you feeling it? Do you day by day carry within you the thirst that is a direct result of the sacrificial life that you live? Being poured out as a drink offering to those around you. Not only those who are sons in your house, but also inside the gambit of your community in which you live. Let me ask you, what are you thirsty for as you are seated here this morning? A new car? Better home? Bigger church? More church members? More sons? More platforms? Better body, go to the gym every week, to go to the gym six hours a week because I need to build some muscle. What is it that? What does thirst do? Thirst is something that drives you. So I need to ask you this morning, what is it that is driving you to fulfill the thirst that is in the inside of you? Let me ask you a very straight question. When did you last lead someone to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as his Lord and as his Savior? I'm not going to ask you to put up your hand because you're going to be ashamed. Jesus' mandate to the church was, go therefore and what? Make disciples. What is a disciple? A disciple is a follower of Jesus, is one that imitates Jesus. If I come and I take a picture of your life, and I put it against the wall next to the picture of the life of Christ. What am I going to see? What is God going to see? It's at times like this that we need to humble ourselves and call out unto the Lord and say, Lord, have mercy. The second quality that we see when we look at the life of Jesus is that of holiness. You know, whenever I speak the word holiness, I can see everybody's minds going. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't dance, don't go to parties, don't swear, don't do this, don't do that. That's not holiness. You know what's holiness? The word holiness actually means separation separation unto God so I come with the next question and I'm asking you to what extent is your life separated unto God what rules your life now maybe you feel confused you don't have to be confused it's very simple what is it in your life that you spend the most time on? That is to what your life is separated. Enough. Huh? Hey, it's getting mighty quiet in this Presbyterian church this morning. I'm not speaking if you have got a full-time full job and you've got to go to work. Now don't put yourself under condemnation. But do you know that within that environment of having a full-time job, 
you have the mandate to manifest Christ. So if you spend eight hours a day and your life within that workplace is to manifest Christ, you are okay. But if you just go there to do the job, to get the salary, to be able to pay your bills, you're in serious trouble. Because then you are not fulfilling your mandate. John 19 verse 26 to 27 tells us, When Jesus therefore saw his mother and disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. So what did Jesus do on the cross? He separated himself from everything, even his mother. He gave away his garment. He gave away his son. He gave his mother. He gave his blood. And he surrendered his spirit. And I want you to understand today, holiness is not about the outward things that you do. Holiness is all about your heart's separation unto God. I want to say to you something today. Some of you are going through daily battles trying to stop smoking, trying to stop doing this, trying to stop doing that. Let me tell you something. If you turn your heart towards God and you become passionate about God and you fill your life with the word of God, sin will leave you. <coughs> sin will leave you. You see, but we try to fight sin on our own terms. I've got an alcoholic and a smoker that I'm working with at the moment. And it's as if you are speaking to a mule. Because he keeps on telling me, I can overcome this. So I will drink less. I'll shift from whiskey to wine. And once I've, I've got onto the wine, I will shift. And then I'm going less and less and less. And then eventually I will be able to stop. I said to him, you are trying to overcome in the arm of the flesh. So he'll take his cigarettes. He'll start with two packs a day. And then he say, okay, today I'll smoke two cigarettes less. Or five cigarettes less. And he'll go for a week or two weeks. Guess what? After three weeks, he's right back where he was in the very beginning. The wine is out the window and he's back to the whiskey. Why? Because my dear... Brothers and sisters, you cannot deliver yourself. It is the word of God that delivers you. He clearly tells us in the scripture, I will send my word to heal you. Most of the time, the sins that capture us is because of that bottomless pit on the inside of us that we try to fold the things to make us feel better. Come on. <laughs> Some of us use alcohol. Some of us use food. So if you had a bad day, you'll go and order a big T-bone steak, a lot of chips, and you'll stuff yourself with that Afterwards, you will feel better and then you will walk past the mirror and you feel guilty and you're all depressed because look at how I'm looking and then this starts the whole process over again and now you go out and order a milkshake so you can just feel better. So I won't eat the steak but I'll have a milkshake. Guys, it is the word that brings the deliverance. I want to ask a very, maybe, hard question to those of you who are pastors and leaders and, and spiritual fathers. 
I want to ask you, can you separate yourself from your sons? What am I, what am I saying? I'm saying, do you have the ability to give away your spiritual son to another father? Are you confused? They're not your sons. They belong to God. If he wants to translate one son from one family into another family, what is it your business? You're only a steward of those sons that God places in your care. And he, if he brings somebody else on the platform or in the environment, that's got a grace configuration that that son needs to elevate him into the next dimension, do you have the ability to sow that son to that grace configuration? That's radical, eh? <coughs> Romans 6, verse 6 to 14 tells us, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life that he gives, he lives to God. Likewise, now listen to this. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, if I shoot a dog and I throw a piece of T-bone steak in front of his mouth, what's going to happen? Nothing. He's dead. So if you tell me you are crucified with Christ, and I'll have to mention a few, if I throw a plate of samosas in front of you, and I throw a chocolate cake in front of you, how dead are you? Or oh, a nice biryani. How dead are you? You guys will get what I'm saying. Have we truly, truly stepped into the dimension and understanding that the work of, that Jesus did on the cross is a complete work? And that we need to reckon ourselves dead to sin. Sin can have no influence on you if you understand the completed work of Christ on the cross. Why is it then that we still struggle with temptations? Come on. Why do you find that people are still tempted? You know why? Pastor? Leaders? Fathers of household? It's your fault. is now getting quiet. Why am I saying that? Because it's a lack of your instruction of teaching your sons the reality of what the Word of God states. You have not cultivated the Word of God on the inside of them that have made them immune and has given them immunity to the temptations of life. Is this a hard word this morning? I don't talk to me. I'm just speaking to myself. It's fine. I'm used to that. Therefore it says, therefore, verse 12, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. 
What does righteousness mean? It means to be in right standing with God. Listen to verse 14. And I want to ask you, do you believe this? It says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. <coughs> I must reckon myself to be dead to sin. And alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the life that you live today, guys, do you live it from that place where you reckon yourself to be dead to sin? What do you do when people offend you? What do you do when people call you bad names? What do you do when people reject you? What do you do when people say bad things about you? Do you bless them? Do you turn to Jesus and say, Lord, I love you. Bless this brother. Bless this person. Lord, prosper him. Or do you call down thunderbolts and lightning from heaven to pulverize him into ashes? Come on, be real. You see, if we begin to understand these principles in the word, and we make it our reality, we will begin to live a life of dominion in which the enemy cannot touch your life. You start to live a kingdom life. And nothing in this world can rule over you. Not circumstances, not finances, not family, not culture, nada, zero, nothing. I'm saying to you, do not allow sin to rule in your life. Who is the one that allows sin to rule in your life? Come on, somebody answer me. Who allows it? You, me, we choose. We choose to allow it to take place. You know, sometimes I think, yes, the Lord created this as wonderful beings, but I think sometimes He really made us stupid. Because you will go and hit, hit your head against that wall 500 times and you will not change your ways. You will keep on stepping into that sin. Or no, you know. That is not a place where I should be. But you will keep on going back there. To satisfy your flesh. Why? Because you do not reckon yourself to be dead. To sin. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, and we all know it by heart. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed, what? To this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The only thing, guys, that can renew your mind, that can change you to be conformed to the ways of God is His Word. It is the Word that renews your mind. But we are too lazy to study the Word. If a preacher stands up here and he preaches to you and he tells you, oh, all the streets of gold that you're going to walk in one day, you swallow it. Hook, line, and sinker. You don't take the time to go and read that scripture. That scripture doesn't speak of streets of gold. It speaks of a street of gold. And if you do a proper study, it links you to John where Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. The street refers to Jesus. Not to a golden street where you're going to walk with your golden slippers. 
When it speaks about the mansions. We've been told from the pulpit so many times, God is going to give you a mansion. And the more you give, the bigger your mansion. Bull twang. There's another word, but I won't use it on the pulpit. Who is the mansion? You are. Your temple is the body, the dwelling place of God. Why do you want to go in a place where he's not present? Come on. The right? Bible teaches us. Absent with the body. Present with Christ. Let me not go there. Let me come back. Galatians 2 verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. That is past tense. It's behind me. I, it is no longer I will live. But Christ lives where? In me. Now what it says, the life I now live, when is that? Now. In the flesh, now. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So why do you still dabble in the things of this world? Galatians 5.24 tells us, Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. You know, if I turn this thing around, it's very scary. It tells me if you are still being driven by your passions and your desires, you have not been crucified with Christ. I actually going to say, are you saved? Are you saved? How do you know that? Because if you've crucified your flesh, or your flesh and your desires has now become aligned with that which is in the heart of God, you're saved. You see, the great damage was done to the church through the sinner's prayer. Come on. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I give you my heart. Forgive all my sins. Amen. Glory, hallelujah, you are now a son of God. Boo, twang. It's only the start. It's only the decision that I'm going to follow Jesus. There needs to follow a lifestyle and a manner of life in which you demonstrate that you are a follower of Christ. I didn't want to upset Pastor Anthony's organization this morning, but I'm going to speak about it anyway. You see, I think it would be good for us to have communion after what I've said, but let me go ahead. You see, the publication of the death of Jesus at the table of the Lord is also a publication, a demonstration, a confession that we have died. That you have been crucified with Christ when he was on the, on the cross. Can somebody in this place please say amen? amen? Let me ask you. Are you holy? <laughs> Why don't you ask, guys speak to me this morning? I'm asking you, are you holy? If you tell me yes, I need to throw you with another ball. That one says, have you crucified the flesh with its desires and with its passions? If you tell me, I'm getting there. If you tell me... I'm struggling. I've not arrived yet. It's fine. You know why? Because the Lord has given us His favor.
as we come to the table of the Lord, we access God's grace to live a life more of deeper separation and holiness unto Him. Pastor Anthony, forgive me, but I'm going to take out the whip now. Who on earth are you, pastor or leader of a household, to tell anybody in your congregation that because of sin in their life, they are not allowed to partake of the table? I'm telling you, you are an abomination before God because you are keeping people from accessing the grace of God at the table. You need to understand that when we come to the table of the Lord, there's two dimensions of grace that we access. The one is salvation grace. That is what Jesus did on the cross. But the one I'm talking about is what we call dominion grace. You come to the table and you partake of the table where you say, Lord, I need your grace to overcome this struggle that I'm having. <coughs> That is why we tell people, I teach the sons in my house, you need to partake of the table at least once a day. You can partake 20 times a day as far as I'm concerned because the Bible teaches us clearly as often as you think of me. So break out of that religious mindset. Remember the scale that I showed you? It's not religion. It's a relationship. You live from the relationship. You see, when we access the table, we access more grace in order to live a life in holiness. We all know 1 Peter 1 verse 16 that says, because it is written, Be holy, for I am a holy. And then when we read this, we've got this mindset of looking at drink and dance and swear and all the rest of the stuff. No. Be separated unto God as I am separated unto God. That is why we say to sons, you can only follow a spiritual father as long as that father is accurately representing Christ. If he is not manifesting Christ, you need to run away. Well, are you guys deaf? <laughs> the other thing that we see when we look at Jesus as the pattern's son is affection. John 19:27, we read it already. When Jesus said to his disciples, Behold, your mother. And then from that hour forth, this disciple took her into his own home. Jesus made sure that his mother was taken care of. Let me ask you this morning. Do you honor and take care of your mother and your father? Don't tell me yes. Why? Because I see all day homes today. Mothers and fathers sitting there, lonely. Sons have not visited them in two years, in three years. The only time they see them is when they call them and say, your mother is dying. And then they come to take what is left and get hold of the testament and the will and they can get their hands on the stuff there needs to come a repentance in this nation because the western culture of not taking care of our parents has made us sick there's a sickness there's a disease Let me ask you this morning, 
when did you last visit your mom and your dad? If they are still alive. When did you last gifted them something? When did you last buy them groceries? When did you last take them for an outing? Doing something special with them that they appreciate. They don't want to sit between those four walls of the old age home, day in and day out, and not go anywhere. Here's my wife, you can ask her. My mother-in-law was to me like my own mother. I would on a regular basis, she loved fish and chips. So I would go and I'd pick her up and I'll take her for lunch. And I let her have some fish and chips. And she loved it. Because at that time, my father-in-law has already passed. It made it day. It's a small thing like that. That can change a person's life. Your parents has brought you through this world. Paid for your education. Clothed you. Fed you. Is it too much to ask if they, when they're weak, in their old age, that you don't take care of them? You know what breaks my heart? If I get into the shopping center and you can clearly see, there's an old man or an old lady. And they come to you with a ton of dog food in their hand and they say tell me can a human person eat this i'm telling you everything inside of me breaks because where is the children why are they not taking care of this children i'm not here to blow my horn but i take that person and i load a trolley whether i've got the money or not i've got a credit card and I'll make sure that when they go out of there, they've got food for a month. And they don't have to eat dog food. We as the church, are you taking care of the widows and the orphans in your, in your community? Okay. Am I still okay, Pastor Anthony? Can I still go? The next one, what we see, what Jesus did on the cross, is he did not retaliate. Luke 23, verse 32 to 34, he says, There were also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus made this statement. <coughs> Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they do, and they divided his garments and cast lots. Jesus forgave those who had no remorse. They were not sorry. So why are you and I waiting for people to come to us to say, Oh, I'm so sorry before you forgive me. Come on. Let's talk about taxes. How many of you sitting here this morning has got unforgiveness in your hearts against taxi drivers? Come on. I, I, I tell you, you've got a... I think, do you think it's, it's a tomb or a church this morning? Jesus forgave them without them asking him for forgiveness. Now what makes you different than Jesus? What gives you the right? To judge that person. I'm not saying what he's doing is right. But what gives you and me the right? To walk in unforgiveness. And frustration. Towards those. I don't approve of what they do. But you are the one that's only keeping yourself in bondage. You are the one that's being hurt. Not when. He's not even aware. 
He's having smooth sailing. He's on his way to pick up his next passenger. You know what's a fear? He feels a fear. I, I feel he's a lunar. Fear. Why? Doesn't bother you. But you sit with a grudge. Your blood pressure rises. You develop ulcers. It's your own fault. Because you do not walk in forgiveness. The question I'm leaving you with is, are you forgiving as Jesus forgives? Can you do that? Can you truly forgive from the heart that person that has wronged you? You're sitting here, somebody else has taken your senior position. But they, in the company, they promised it to you that you are going to be promoted. Then they took somebody from the outside and they promoted them. Are you still angry? Do you carry offense in your heart towards that person? He's got nothing to do with it. You're still angry at the company? So you go on a slow strike? I only do what I need to do? Just enough to stay out of trouble? Come on. Is that Christ-like attitude? Is that the way that Christ conducted himself? No. So if you tell me you are saved, there's some things that need to radically change. Jesus, so you taught us to pray in Matthew. He says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Matthew 6.14 says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. So if you understand this, can you just reckon for a moment how stupid it is for you not to forgive? Because you put yourself in a cage. Jesus says, I want to forgive you, but I can't because you didn't forgive. Guys, if you've got a grudge, it does not mean that you are not saved. But the problem is, you will never come to a place where you walk in dominion. Because that thing of unforgiveness will keep you in the hole. You will never come to dominion or all aspects and areas of your life. The Bible tells us clearly, Philippians 2, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. Being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Let me ask you, is this mind in you and me? Do we have the very same mind that there was in the mind of Christ? Who emptied himself of himself, who counted it no loss, to set aside all that was his in order to serve with his very life, you and me. Let us do a quick test and then I think I should land the plane. I've got a lot more to say still, but uh, let me just end off with a couple of questions. Let me ask you, are you title conscious? 
Let me repeat this. Are you title conscious? If you are not addressed by titles, do you get upset? You know, I've seen so often at conferences, pastors get upset if you don't introduce them by all their titles and all their qualifications. You know, somebody comes to me and they shake my hand and say, I am Apostle, Doctor, Pastor, Evangelist, so and so. I know this, this guy's got a problem. I need to lay my hands and he needs deliverance from the fivefold ministry. When you, as a leader, when you mess up, when you make a mistake, are you able to go to people that you've wronged and say to them, I'm sorry? But remember, the prodigal son returned home and he asked the forgiveness of his father. As a son, are you willing to go back to your father and say, Dad, I'm so sorry. I really messed up. I rebelled. I was arrogant. As a son in the house, are you able to accept correction when the father takes out the circumcision blade and he circumcises you? Can you take it? Remember David? When the prophet Nathan came to him and he said to him, You are that man. What did he do? He didn't kick Nathan out of the door. He repented. He was able to accept correction. <laughs> this is a good one. <coughs> Excuse me. Do you refuse to receive gifts? Come on. When you come to someone and say, I just want to bless you, here's something for you. They say, oh, no, no, really, I, I don't need this. You know, I'm fine, thank you. You don't have to give me anything. That's pride. If I come to you and I give you a second-hand jacket, jacket, can you receive it? Because pride will say, you, this is the second hand thing, I don't want it. My second hand jacket that I give to you could be the best thing that I have. And now you reject it. You know, it's like when I go with some pastors into the rural areas and we will visit some of my sons in those areas. And they will come with a chicken and they will kill a chicken and they will serve the, what do you call it, nala with some pop. That guy wants to run out of the door. He says, no, chicken feet. He says, hi, I can't eat it. I'm not hungry. I've got a stomach ache. Those people have slaughtered the only chicken on their property to serve you. Are you guys seeing? We need to look at our hearts. What is in your heart? There's no gift too big or too small. Whether somebody comes to me and they give me a tithe and it's 50 cents, I heave it before God. Because that is what that person has in his hand to give. And he's not giving it to me. He's giving it to God. Who are you to judge? Remember the old woman with the, with, the, with, the, with the two mites? Jesus said, she has given more. Well, she gave, gave out of her lack. Are you a team player? What does it mean? It means, do you esteem others higher than yourself? Can you attend meetings and conferences like this and just be happy to sit there and not say a word? Just to receive from whoever it is 
that God has appointed for that session to, re to release the word. Without the expectation of being asked to speak. You know, it's funny. Pastors are funny animals. I watch them. I will invite them. I have conferences every month. And I'll say to them, please come and join us. They never come. But boy, oh boy, let me tell them, listen, we're having another conference this, this month. Would you please come and join us and just share a, share a word with us? All of a sudden, they, their diary opens up. And they're available and they're ready to attend. Let me tell you, if you are not able to sit under the grace of another man, it doesn't matter how young, how old he is, how experienced it is, how elevated it is, how big his church is. I okay, care none of that. If you do not have the ability to tap grace from that person, there's something seriously wrong with you. Because we do not connect to the man. We connect to the grace, the Christ on the inside of that man. Church, do you hear me this morning? Are you able to get into a taxi or go drive around with a cheaper car? <laughs> there was one apostle that I knew that we sent a car to pick him up. He was to be one of the speakers. It was a Toyota. He refused to get in the car. We had to send a Mercedes. <laughs> and as a direct result, I had to hire a Mercedes. And of course, he was late for the conference. Then, when you invite him to go someplace, you need to supply him with accommodation. He will inform you. Only five star. And I only sleep on a king size bed. Of course, he never gets invited again. Um, do you get angry when somebody ignores you? You don't get a front seat. You, <laughs> sorry, Pastor Anthony. You don't get invited into the pastor's lounge. You sit here, you're a pastor, but you're not invited to go and sit inside there. Do you get angry? Do you get invited, uh, upset? If you are a leader and the people that you are leading, there's some people that can do stuff better than you. Do you get upset? Do you feel it's demeaning? You sit under someone else's ministry. Or do you want to be the one in charge that always plays the guitar and let the puppets dance? Do you dread going to a poor man's house? You know, this is something that really breaks my heart. I go a lot into rural areas. Where there's nothing. Sometimes we just sit under the tree. There's not even a chair. And sometimes the tree doesn't even have leaves. So you're in the sun. And pastors that I invite. Will not go with me. They see it as being beneath their stature. Here's another one. Do you look down upon other races and cultures? Do you believe your culture to be better than another's culture? Let me tell you a story. If you are saved, if you are truly born again, there's just one culture. Kingdom culture. There's no Indian culture, white culture, colored culture. Chinese culture, Japanese culture, Asian culture, whatever you want to call it. There's one culture, and that is kingdom culture. Yes. 
Do you despise to send your children to public school for schooling? Do your children have to be in a private school? And then lastly, can you forgive as Jesus forgave? Again, I'm asking this question. Why is it that as a nation we continue to go back to colonialism, to apartheid? Why is it? I'll tell you why. Because it is not forgiven. I have really come to a place where people start crying about these things. I just tell them, ah, change this talk. Get over yourself. But it is wrong death. I'm not saying anything was right. Here. I was in trouble more than I can ever tell you. Because I was a cop in those years. And uh, I was prosecuted and persecuted, and I don't know what secuted it all else, because I refused to arrest people for passports. Because I believe as a believer, it is unrighteous, it's ungodly. I was investigated by the security branches of that time. as being a spy. I was a danger to society. African, white African society. Not the blacks. Or the colors or whoever. So guys, I leave you with this. It is my prayer that you will really take what I've shared with you this morning. It's not the kind of message that I normally release. You can ask my wife, I've been wrestling with this thing for the past week, five o'clock this morning. She asked me, why are you sitting straight up in bed? I say, I'm wrestling with this thing because the Lord has burst this thing on the inside of me and I must deliver it. And I know I can offend a lot of people this morning, but I have to deliver what the Lord has placed upon my, upon my heart. It is my prayer that you will receive this word in the heart that has been given to you, that you will hear the voice of the Father in the Father, that you will hear the voice of the Holy Spirit this morning, and where you need to repent, that true repentance will come. And you know, repentance is to turn around, to move away, to change, and not to go back to that again. God bless you. Pastor Anthony, Stel, thank you so much for this opportunity.